Good morning. So I have heard due to the gala dinner yesterday, it was a pretty short night for just a few people, I guess. Might be for all of them. Uh, I didn't attend either way. Um, good morning to our session on additive manufacturing. Um, I will be the host. My name is Ingo Markelwasser from Siemens. Um, I'm heading a department uh, within manufacturing development and industrialization, and that deals with digitization, um, new materials such as CMCs and additive manufacture. And it's my pleasure uh, to be also the moderator of this morning session of one and a half hours. Uh, the first half hour, we will be having a keynote lecture by Professor Lyons from Fraunhofer IWS in Dresden, Germany. And we will be also having a panel discussion in the subsequent hour, um, together with two colleagues from industry, from uh, GE, um, Dr. Höbel, Matthias Höbel, and from Siemens, Dr. Haberland, as well as, together with Christoph Lines, a second um, yeah, representative or rep presenter from um, the R&D field of application and also R&D providers from Fraunhofer IPT Production Technology, Dr. Bergs, who is the Executive uh, Managing Director of Fraunhofer IPT in Aachen. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Christoph Lines, but before we start, I was asked by the panel, just raise your hands if you already have had any kind of connection to additive manufacture. Do you use additive manufacture? Do you already know what it is? Okay. Yeah, these are quite a few people, Christoph. So you do not have to start with a real basis. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, additive manufacture is the, um, the opposite of subtractive manufacture. So we, we, we add material and we do not subtract it. Okay. Um, let me introduce Christoph Lyons. Um, I do not have any kind of short bios to introduce all the people, so I would like to ask the presenters um, to say two or three introducing sentences to themselves. But Christoph Lyons and I, we, we know each other since uh, a few years, um, when you started at DLR, after your, um, yeah, you have studied mechanical engineering in, in Aachen, at RWTH Aachen University, afterwards you went to DLR. Uh, after your uh, dissertation and PhD thesis, and then you were, as far as I remember, uh, head of a chair at the um, BTU Cottbus University, and right now since two or three years, might be longer, four years? Oh, almost seven. Almost seven yeah. years, oh man, time flies. Um, since seven years you are with IWS and also with the um, University of Technology in Dresden. But Christoph, um, please introduce yourself a, a little bit in, in more detail. And you will be um, presenting additive manufacturing for, of course, turbo machinery. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ingo, for the uh, kind introduction and good morning, everybody. Can, can you hear me okay? Is that loud enough? Okay, thank you. Yeah, as Ingo said, um, uh, I'm working with... Um, uh, Fraunhofer IWS, the Institute for Materials and Beam Technology in, in Dresden. Uh, actually, I'm not a mechanical engineer by education, but I'm a materials engineer by, by education. And I just jumped into this field, this vibrant field of, of additive manufacturing. Um, and as most of you know who are involved with additive manufacturing, uh, materials are really uh, key, uh, play a key role. And, and maybe one of the messages uh, to take home uh, today is that those of you who are involved in additive manufacturing are no longer component producers uh, by an innovative uh, manufacturing technology, but you're also materials producers. And, and that changes uh, the world uh, quite, quite a bit, I, I would say. Um, at the same time, um, um, working for Fraunhofer IWS as a director right now, um, I'm also a university professor at the uh, TU Dresden, which is a technical university in Dresden. Now, uh, just a quick uh, overview of what Fraunhofer IWS is doing in terms of, of um, uh, focus, research R&D focuses. Um, we are working on uh, basically two areas, laser materials uh, processing as well as uh, material science and engineering with a major focus on surface engineering and coatings. So within our business units, we are working on ablation and cutting using laser as a tool. Uh, we are working on microtechnology and joining. 
Um, we also do PVD and nanotechnology, basically coatings, thin films. Uh, we also do chemical surface and reaction technology, and then some kind of in between laser materials processing and, and surface engineering and coatings. Um, we look at additive manufacturing as well as thermal surface technology. So uh, within Fraunhofer, uh, we are running probably one of Europe's largest R&D centers for additive manufacturing, which is run in collaboration with the Technical University. And um, just as a, at, at a glance, um, those are the processes on the left-hand side that we're dealing with uh, in this center. So, oops, I'm sorry, that was too quick. Um, so as you might see, those of you who are familiar with that, uh, we are basically focusing on, on metals, so additive manufacturing of metals. So we're working with um, a powder-based, uh, wire-based direct metal deposition, um, hybrid processing, and I will give you some examples um, of those processes later on. Uh, but we are also working with the powder bed systems, uh, such as SLM, selective laser melting, as well as electron beam melting. And then for more functional uh, purposes and functional devices, uh, we also look at 3D printing, as well as stereolithography. And of course, we also do testing and characterization of the parts. Uh, we are thinking along and working along uh, the processing chain. It's not only um, the, the additive manufacturing process itself that we are looking at, but we are looking at the processing chain, starting with um, the product development strategies, uh, with uh, process development, materials development, and uh, then finally ending with quality control and testing and characterization. Um, we have great support by a, um, a German project, uh, which is a 45 million euro funding um, uh, accompanied with uh, about the same amount of money from industry uh, contracts. It's probably Europe's largest AM project that we have initiated and coordinate and are now coordinating um, in, our um, in our institute. Now, for those of you who are not really familiar with additive manufacturing, this gives um, um, kind of an idea how additive manufacturing works. So... Um, Think about a component, um, an airfoil, for example. This component is designed in a computer, so you have CAD data. This data is fed into a machine, and the machine is um, building the part uh, layer by layer by uh, putting a, uh, a metal layer down, uh, grain by grain, if you will. And, uh, of course, you need a heat source uh, that melts the, the particles, uh, the metal particles, um, that could be either a laser or a, um, an electron beam. And then finally, the part grows out of the powder bed. And this is the powder bed system here. And you just have to blow off the powder. And um, basically, and that's kind of a vision, of course, um, the, the, um, the part is ready to be used. Uh, everybody who's involved in that knows that there's a lot more to do with the part after you, you take it out of the machine. But anyway, now, if you look at these basic processes by which uh, metal parts can be done by additive manufacturing, there are two groups, mainly. Uh, one group is the, the, the group of powder bed processes. Uh, one of them was just shown in the video. Um, the electron beam uh, melting, by the way, uh, that was the case that I showed here. Uh, selective laser melting is another uh, method. And if you look at uh, the green and the red uh, bullets here, um, those are the pros or the, the advantages and some of the challenges in, in red uh, that are um, um, getting along or coming along with those uh, processes. So with the powder bed systems, you can um, produce highly complex parts um, uh, in, for the EBM uh, systems, high-performance materials such as uh, oxygen-prone materials, titanium uh, titanium and aluminite and other materials can be can be built. Um, there are some challenges with uh, regards to build rate, of course. Um, uh, precision of the part uh, can be an issue. Um, repair strategies are kind of difficult to follow with those um, methodologies. But other than that, of course, these powder bed systems are uh, the most well-known systems or technologies being used in. Uh, additive right, right now. There's another group of uh, technologies, and um, those I will talk about mainly uh, during my, my presentation today, and those are the, the processes we call direct uh, laser deposition or direct material deposition uh, processes. Um, so you can start with powder. 
Um, so sometimes we are calling them a blown powder process, or you can start with wire. So um, in, in our cases, uh, the heat source is always a laser, and um, this gives you a high degree of freedom. And just in order to, to give you a flavor of how the process works, um, this is a, a little uh, video here showing uh, the blown powder process on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, it's a schematic. So what you basically do is um, you heat up um, material, you produce a melt pool, uh, the melt pool is maintained by particles that are blown into the melt pool, and track by track, you build up uh, material on a build plate or on a part that needs to be repaired, for example. Now, in terms of technology, um, the, um, this technology is capable of um, making a very filigree part with um, highly uh, complex structures as well as uh, large volume components. And I will show you some examples of that later on. So uh, when talking about more specific um, um, values here from, from the technology, we can go down to track width of 30 microns only. So it's 0.03 millimeters in, in track width uh, with high reproducibility, and I will show you pictures later on. And we can go up to 45 millimeters. So uh, again, you can use it the same technology, it's scalable. You can use it for um, filigree parts as well as large volume parts. In terms of materials, um, uh, there's a huge uh, base of knowledge on, on titanium, nickel, and steel, but um, for some other example or uh, some, some other uh, applications other than turbo machinery, for example, in, um, in, in space applications, we are also looking at specialty materials um, such as platinum based materials and, and other materials. Now, the second uh, method we are working with in, in additive manufacturing in our laboratory, in our center, is uh, the wire-based um, direct metal deposition uh, process. Um, again, it's a coaxial design that we're using in which, in this case, the wire is in the center and the laser beam is split into three parts, three-part beams, uh, centers around the, uh, the wire and melts uh, the wire, which is then deposited as a, as a track, as a weld track, on um, a build plate, and by that, you can also build um, a part of, of a 3D part. Uh, the advantage of using wire instead of powder is uh, you can use 100% of the wire that you purchase. Uh, there's no powder uh, spoliation, there's no um, loss of powder, um, so it's a, it's a clean process in, in terms of working environment. Um, you almost have no size limits if you're carrying your cladding hat on a robot system. Uh, huge components can be, can be built. And actually, you end up with a, a pretty good surface quality. Um, one of the uh, drawbacks of this technology is that the feature sizes are kind of limited to um, beyond a millimeter or so. So we, are, we actually, we're working right now at a syst on a system that is um, getting down to uh, 0.2 micro, um, 0.2 millimeters, 200 microns uh, track width with a wire. All right. Now, um, as I said, the the technology is is scalable, so we can cover applications from the micro scale uh, to the macro scale, and this is, uh, of course, then in terms of um, precision and, and productivity. Um, sometimes an issue uh, in, in a way that, of course, for the, the large components, you will not get the ultimate precision, while for the ultimate precise parts, you will not get um, a very high productivity, as you, as you can, can, can imagine. Now, let's give me um, a few examples of what we are doing in the micro world. Um, those are examples showing a product or uh, demonstrator parts, actually, uh, since uh, additive manufacturing also in the gas turbine industry has become a, a very hot topic, um, all the customers um, we are working with um, in the R&D center, um, they, most of them, they didn't allow me to show actual parts. So I will sh give you demonstrator parts or demonstrator components that show the feasibility of this, um, this, this technology. So we are talking about filigree tiny, tiny parts uh, here that can be done by um, direct uh, metal deposition uh, technology. And now one example I, I am allowed to give you, uh, which uh, shows that additive has already been 
introduced into production is um, a, a technology that we have developed together with Rolls-Royce um, in Germany as well as in Derby. And um, this shows an application for um, a, a component that carries a thermal barrier coating. It is actually not a, um, uh, an airfoil, but it's a liner. Um, the liner is uh, used in the hottest part of the engine. And um, I'm not allowed to, sh to say where exactly, but you can imagine where. where. Um, and, and one of the problems with these liners is that they are carrying thermal barrier coatings that are prone to spallation when the engine is, is cycling, thermal cycling. Okay, You're all aware of that, that fact. So what we've developed together with Airbus, and actually this technology is now flying as we speak. Actually, it's flying in the Trend XWB um, uh, engine powering the A350 is, um, in a sense, a very simple approach, a simple engineering approach. So we are producing clamping structures by micro LMD um, using a grid-like structure. The uh, structure is then overcoated. Um, again, I'm not allowed to show you details, but uh, when the video stops, you will see uh, the, the basic idea behind it. So we are producing clamping structures with these mushroom-like um, heads, and those heads, they are clamping the white stuff that is on, on top of um, the, the airfoil or the liner structure, which is the thermal barrier coating. And by using this technology, the lifetime of the, um, the, the TBC is increased by a factor of five. And um, that was good enough uh, for, for, a, for a business case for, for, for Rolls-Royce. So this is now in, in production in these, in these engines. Um, now here's some, some other examples. Um, this is again a micro structure. Uh, it's, it's a, a honeycomb-like structure. As you can see here, uh, it's kind of hard to read. Um, the height of these, um, these walls here is uh, more than two millimeters, and the thickness of the walls is below 100 microns. Uh, this is an X-ray scan showing that there's no porosity, no cracks, um, uh, very good homogeneity, uh, perfect bonding to the, um, to the underlying substrate or component. So it's a very versatile technology in order to make honeycomb structures. Now this is another example of filigree structures, um, another type of clamping structure. Um, this is, if you look at the, um, the powder that is the oversprayed powder, the size of the oversprayed powder, um, um, you can guess the size of, of these, these clamping structures. So out of the uh, computer, you can design the structure, and you can simply make it by uh, LM, LMD, uh, different materials, different types of application. Now, uh, you might ask yourself, is it um, possible with wire as well? This gives you some, some examples of uh, wire-based uh, small size uh, features. Again, I'm unfortunately not allowed to show you real components here. Uh, just a few examples. As you see, wire is not as precise as powder, at least not up to now and, and today. Um, but still, we can, can make uh, nice features, also small scale features. Um, this has a couple of millimeters in height, um, 400 microns in, in diameter, Wall thickness is not as precise as we, we can guarantee for powder-based uh, process, but um, not, not that bad. All right. Um, uh, this is um, a, a high-speed video showing how the wire-based process runs. And as you can, can certainly see, on the left-hand side, it's, um, um, it, it shows an example of how important... Uh, knowing about the processing parameters is. Obviously, on the left-hand side, it's non-optimized process. So the, um, the bubble, the melt bubble, uh, sticks to the wire rather than uh, forming a melt pool on, on the, uh, the component. So on the right-hand side, you see a very smooth process. It's a it's very, um, very boring process if you look at it. I mean, nothing, nothing uh, spectacular happens. Uh, it's very smooth, uh, gives you nice surface quality, uh, there's no porosity, it's, it's full bonding um, and um, very good um, materials properties. Now, talking about the macro scale, um, one technology that we are following right now, um, not only 
in, in our laboratory, but in, in other laboratories worldwide, is, is hybrid laser uh, manufacturing. Um, as you know, those of you who are using additive manufacturing, uh, the part that's coming out of the, the AM machine is not yet ready to be used. So machining is always involved, and um, this is a video from uh, the DMG Mori company, and um, over the last couple of years, we have developed a machine concept together with them, and actually the, uh, the laser cladding uh, processing unit is, is um, IWS, front of our IWS development, uh, and this shows um, uh, a process of, of a turbine uh, casing uh, component, um, again, a demonstrator component, that is being built by um, laser cladding, powder-based laser cladding, if you will. Um, the machine is able to uh, change from additive manufacturing to subtractive manufacturing. Um, it can be used as a milling and also drilling machine, as you can see. So within the same clamping, within the same machine, you're building the part, and then from time to time you can interrupt the building process, the additive process, and uh, machine the part. Um, for those parts who are less complex, and um, this is probably not a perfect example in this video here because complexity is not that high, for those parts that are not very complex, uh, you might argue uh, that it is much cheaper and more efficient to build the part first and then machine it afterwards. But there are quite a few applications where parts complexity is so high that you first of all uh, build a part at least partly and then machine in regions that are no longer accessible when the whole part is, is fully built. Okay, so you kind of in between machine your part and um, then continue with, um, with building the part. Now, this is an example, uh, a recent example uh, coming out of a, an ESA uh, project where um, we were um, uh, contracted to, uh, to build a rocket part. Uh, the part itself, it, um, it's shown on the, um, um, the left-hand side, the picture on the, the bottom left-hand side here, has a size of about 40 centimeters in, in height and a diameter of... Um, uh, the largest diameter, uh, diameter uh, probably 20 uh, centimeters or so. It's built from, um, um, from a nickel-based uh, alloy, and it's uh, built exactly in this machine here. Um, so, of course, it's a multi-step multiple step process, uh, starting with, um, of course, the design of, of the part first, and then the parameter definition uh, for the uh, materials deposition. Um, followed by the LMD process it itself. Um, the as-built component then is being uh, machined. Um, and, uh, of course, we do a quality check, uh, not only from the outside, checking the outside geometries, but also uh, doing CT scanning to uh, be able to, to see any um, failures, any, any flaws, any pores, uh, cracks, and, and um, defects. Uh, in, on the inside of um, the, the, the component. Now, the, the same technology, um, which is a combined technology of additive manufacturing and subtractive manufacturing, uh, we follow in robot-based uh, systems as well. Um, this gives you another flavor and example of uh, component and, and components and, and parts uh, for turbo machinery applications. Um, the processing heads can be carried not only on, on, on in CNC machines or by CNC machines, but also by robot systems. Um, and um, by that, you can build uh, large components. Actually, uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you the component itself because it's still confidential, but we've been contracted by ESA um, um, a couple of weeks ago to build a uh, part that goes to space. It's a um, telescope support structure, a radar, X-ray, I'm sorry, X-ray telescope support structure, which has a diameter of three meters. Um, and it's a, um, a lightweight structure, so we have a lot of support structures uh, within this component. 
uh, a maximum height of the structure of 35 centimeters and the width or a diameter of, of three meters. And this part is being built on a robot system, um, uh, a double robot system, one robot carrying the, um, the laser cladding unit, the other robot system carrying the, um, the machining unit. And um, so, as you can guess from this example, um, additive manufacturing is not only shooting for small and mid-sized parts, but we are thinking big these days as well. Um, and this is the last example um, that we are following in a research project right now. Um, <clears throat> this is additive manufactured large-scale, uh, large-volume structures. Um, as you can see here, this is um, a support or stiffening structure. Uh, this is the conventional way of building uh, stiffeners for, uh, for train cars, for example. Um, this is a modern design of a, of a stiffening structure, and this is kind of hard to build by uh, conventional manufacturing. So uh, one of the projects we are running within this huge um, publicly funded project is uh, building large components by additive manufacturing. So we are talking about 10, 12, 15 meter size components right now. Now, as, uh, as a summary, um, I would like to say that uh, most of you who are involved with additive know that additive manufacturing is certainly a, uh, a vibrant field. Um, it brings together uh, expertise from, from different areas, and um, this is not only nice, uh, but it's a must. Um, so we, we need designers who understand how to, to design a part that is good for additive manufacturing or who understand that additive manufacturing gives you a large degree of freedom that is impossible with conventional um, manufacturing technologies. Uh, we need software development, software design uh, specifically dedicated for additive manufacturing. Of course, we need to uh, further develop uh, the, the technology. Um, there are numerous challenges uh, to be tackled in additive. Uh, productivity of the process, build rates is, is one, uh, parts quality is another, and we will talk about many more of those aspects uh, later on during the uh, panel discussion. Then the, the process itself is, is extremely important. As I said in the beginning, uh, we are not only making a part, we are also making the material at the same time. So we definitely need to understand the, um, the relationship between the process and the, uh, the material, the material properties, which then end up um, to um, determine the, the parts properties. And of course, material. Uh, as, I, as I said, material is, is, is really key. Um, it's, it's not only about making a shape or a, a, a structure. It's, it's, it's about making the material, using the right material at the right place, um, modifying the microstructure to get the, the properties right, and so on and so forth. So with that, I think, I hope I increase your appetite uh, for, for additive manufacturing. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have further interest in, in additive, there are two uh, workshops or conferences I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, one workshop has been held in Dresden, Germany in February 8 to 9 on additive manufacturing, and there's another nice workshop uh, in the U.S., uh, in, also in February 21st to 22nd um, in Houston, Texas. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, if you have any questions, you might ask them now or during the um, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Yeah, um, as mentioned by Christoph, if we do have, or you have any kind of uh, questions right now directly related to that talk, please raise your hands and we have time for at least two or three questions. Go ahead. Reza, how are you here? Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. One of the key issues is failure mode. In a traditional subtractive manufacturing, you actually melt, and during the uh, uh, basically when, when, the, when the metal solidifies, there's not enough surface area. You can also you don't get so many grain boundaries. You don't get any um, impurities 
as a degrade boundary. During an additive process, the process controls the possibility of either the gas or other impurities getting at the interfaces during the solidification process. Hmm. So my question relates to load carrying as well as failure modes that can occur, especially when you have temperature gradients, very large temperature gradients. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us your experiences related to uh, failure modes, upper failure modes that may occur with creep, low cycle fatigue or high cycle fatigue mm -hmm. with uh, additive manufacturing? Yeah. Um, you're certainly right in, in saying that um, by using additive instead of uh, casting or forging and then machining parts, um, uh, it completely changes the, the, the microstructure of, of the material, of the starting material. That's, that's certainly correct. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that uh, most of the parts, particularly those which are... Um, loaded parts, I mean heavily loaded parts, they certainly require heat treatment. And by heat treatment, you can, of course, um, modify the microstructure. Um, if you, for example, shoot for um, um, a, a grain size that is, is, is large enough uh, in order to uh, prevent rapid creep, um, that can be done by, by heat treatment uh, without major problems. Um, if you uh, try to modify microstructures to tailor uh, fatigue, for example, uh, depending on the material, I mean, for titanium it's different than for nickel and for, for steel, again, you can tailor the microstructure after the, 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 the AM process uh, by, by heat treatment. Um, so, so this is extremely important. This is what, what I say. When... when Using additive manufacturing, you're also building the material, and the material is, is uh, important. The material's properties are important for the, um, the properties of the, of the component. Yes, um, there is a lot of more work to be done. Um, we have seen applications, for example, aerospace applications, where additive manufacturing is being used for repair of BLISC structures, for example. Um, where fatigue is, is, is a problem uh, rather than, than creep, um, we are able to rebuild the airfoil um, within the, the, the spec of, um, a property, of all the properties that are required for a new part, which is coming out of a forged uh, billet and, and then machined down the way. So um, it, it depends on the part, it depends on the component, and it depends on the material, but you are certainly right, we need to take a look at that, and we need to um, keep in mind that the microstructure of the material we are depositing is different from what we are used to when we look at a, a machine part f out of a, a forged billet, for example. Does uh, the role of impurities, particularly I'm worried about oxidants, cause yeah. another impurity? Can you yeah, the role of impur impurities is, is the question. Um, for example, if we look at titanium, Titanium is extremely prone to oxygen. Um, so we, we need to take care of the oxygen content of the powder first. So we start with the low oxygen uh, content in the powder. We need to take care of the process itself. So we need to shield the uh, processing zone, so the melting zone. Uh, we can do that by process gas, uh, inert gas that protects the, 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 uh, the melting zone. We've looked at that uh, very, uh, very carefully, actually, for titanium blisk parts. And what we saw is that we increased, during the process, we totally increased the amount of oxygen in the part relative to the starting oxygen content of the powder by 10% only. So if you start with 400 ppm oxygen in a titanium part, for example, in, in a powder, for example, for a titanium part, you will end up with 440 ppm of oxygen in the, the fully machined part, which is... Perfect, in, in this case. If you don't do the shielding, for example, you end up in trouble. That's for sure. Thank you, Christoph. Due to the time running, might be... Is, is your question a short question? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, very, very good question. Um, the, um, the, there have been developments over the last couple of years showing that also uh, single crystal parts are possible. So it is possible to, to, to make single crystal parts, but it's, um, I wouldn't say that, I mean, the, the TRL level is, is still pretty low. So, um, yes, you can do that. Um, you have to control the solidification process layer by layer. Um, you, you can do that. That has been shown in, in the laboratory uh, that it's possible, but it has not been done on, the, on a large scale. Christoph, thank you very much again, and you're of welcome. course, all, you're all welcome to ask uh, additional questions in, uh, within the panel discussion that is right now following. Thank you very much again. Sure.